it was a major breakthrough. Stress didn't cause ulcers. Case closed. But a few years later, the research took a new twist. Scientists discovered that this ulcer-causing bacteria wasn't unique. In fact, as much as two-thirds of the world's population has it. So why do only a fraction of these people develop ulcers? Research revealed that when stressed, the body begins shutting down all non-essential systems, including the immune system. And it became clear that if you shut down the immune system, stomach bacteria can run amok. Because what the stress does is wipe out the ability of your body to begin to repair your stomach walls when they start rotting away from this bacteria. So stress can cause ulcers by disrupting our body's ability to heal itself. If stress can undermine the immune system, what other havoc can it wreak? One answer comes from a colony of captive macaque monkeys near Winston-Salem, North Carolina. People think of stress as something that keeps them up at night or something that makes them yell at their kids. But when you ask me, what is stress, I say, look at it. It's, it's this huge plaque in this artery. That's what stress is. For two decades, Dr. Carol Shively has been studying the arteries of macaques. Like baboons and British civil servants, these primates organize themselves into distinctly hierarchical groups and subject one another to social stress. Stress hormones can trigger an intense negative cardiovascular response, a pounding heart, and increased blood pressure. So if stress follows rank, would the cardiovascular system of a high-ranking macaque call him a primate CEO, be different from his subordinate? When Shively looked at the arteries of a dominant monkey, one with little history of stress, its arteries were clean. But a subordinate monkey's arteries told a grim tale. A subordinate artery has lots more atherosclerosis built up inside it than a dominant artery is. Stress and the resulting flood of hormones had increased blood pressure, damaging artery walls, making them repositories for plaque. So now when you feel threatened, your arteries don't expand and your heart muscle doesn't get more blood and that can lead to a heart attack. This is not an abstract concept. It's not something that maybe someday you should do something about. You need to attend to it today because it's affecting the way your body functions. And stress today will affect your health tomorrow and for years to come. Social and psychological stress, whether macaque, human, or baboon, can clog our arteries, restrict blood flow, jeopardize the health of our heart, and that's just the beginning of stress's deadly curse. Robert's early research demonstrated that stress can work on us in an even more frightening way. Well, back when I was starting in this business, what I wound up focusing on was what seemed an utterly implausible idea at the time, which was chronic stress and chronic exposure to glucocorticoids could do something as unsubtle and grotesque as kill some of your brain cells. As a PhD candidate at Rockefeller University in the early 80s, Sapolsky collaborated with his mentor, Dr. Bruce McEwen, to follow the path of stress into the brain. They subjected lab rats to chronic stress and then examined their brain cells. The team made an astonishing find. While the cells of normal rat brains have extensive branches, stressed rats' brain cells were dramatically smaller. And what was most interesting in many ways was the part of the brain where this was happening, hippocampus. You take intro neurobiology any time for the last 5,000 years and what you learn is hippocampus is learning and memory. 
stress in these rats shrank the part of their brain responsible for memory. Stress affects memory in two ways. Chronic stress can actually change brain circuits so that we lose the capacity to remember things as we need to. Very severe acute stress can have another effect which is often we refer to as stress makes you stupid which is making it impossible for you in sh over short periods of time to remember things you know perfectly well. We all know that phenomenon, we all know that one from back when when we stressed ourselves by not getting any sleep at all and the next morning at nine o'clock we couldn't remember a single thing for that final exam. You take a human and stress them big time, long time, and you're going to have a hippocampus that pays the price as well. In addition to undermining our health, stress can make us feel plain miserable. Carol Shively set out to find out why. She began not with misery, but with pleasure. Shively suspected that there was a link between stress, pleasure, and where we stand on the social hierarchy. Just like stress, Pleasure is linked to the chemistry of the brain. When a neurotransmitter called dopamine is released in the brain, it binds to receptors signaling pleasure. Shively used a PET scanner to examine the brain of a non-stressed primate, our primate CEO. What we see is that the brains of dominant monkeys light up bright with lots of dopamine binding in this area that's so important to reward and feeling pleasure about life. Shively then looked at the subordinate's brain. What we discovered is that the brains of the subordinate monkeys are very, very dull because there's much less receptor binding going on in this area. Why is that? What is it about this? area of the brain. When you have less dopamine, everything around you that you would normally take pleasure in is less pleasurable. So the sun doesn't shine so bright, the grass is not so green, food doesn't taste as good. It's because of the way your brain is functioning that you're doing that and your brain's functioning that way because you're low on a social status hierarchy. One feature of low rank is being low ranking, the reality. An even stronger feature by the time you get to humans is not just being low ranking or poor, it's feeling low ranking or poor. And one of the best ways for society to make you feel like one of the have-nots is to rub your nose over and over and over again with what you don't have. Richmond, California, a town where society's extremes can be spotted right from your car. This is cardiologist Jeffrey Ritterman's regular commute. You can learn a lot about the, the stress and health outcome just from the neighborhoods you visit. In, in this neighborhood, the, uh, the life expectancy is quite good and most of the people are pretty healthy. And uh, as we reach the top of the hill, it gets to be a little bit uh, less privileged. And as we make this transition, the uh, social status begins to drop and correspondingly in those areas the, the health outcome is much worse. And these people are not going to have the same life expectancy as the people in the, the middle class area we started in. People are on guard, people are vigilant, they're living a more stressful life. This is a community that produces high stress hormones in people and over time it takes its toll. One of Dr. Ritterman's patients is 65-year-old Emmanuel Johnson. His career? Guidance counselor in one of America's most dangerous neighborhoods. Well, last year I think we had 47 homicides. You know, in the last uh, four days we had 11 shootings, three deaths. And I just know nine times out of ten it's going to be a relative or someone that the kids know. For Emmanuel Johnson, there is a price for chronic exposure to this stress. Five years ago I had a heart attack. I'm a diabetic too. I have to work on it constantly because I've been in this business 20 years. So it's just it's stressful just working the job. So over the years, the, you know, the, the, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, the sugar came on later, but the stress was always there long before they came on. Emmanuel Johnson's body may be telling yet another story of stress. 
The Whitehall study in England found an incredible link between stress, your position in the social hierarchy, and how you put on weight.